All right, so in this Math 2417 review, we'll be going over some basic integration rules, approximating the area under a curve, and taking the area under a curve using the limit definition. So we started off with some basic integration. And I guess the first thing we need to address is well, what is an integral? And the shortest answer to that is an integral is an antiderivative. So if we have some function and we take its derivative, then we would get f prime of x. So then if we took the integral of f prime of x, we would actually get that original f of x function plus a constant. And I'll go into depth about why we get this constant here a little later. But it's helpful to think of it as derivatives and integrals are kind of opposites. The derivative of the integral of some function. You can say that's just equal to function itself. Um, as far as what the integral means geometrically, I'd like to talk a bit more about the derivative. If we have some function and it looks like this, then the derivative gives us the slope at a certain point. Um, and that's what the derivative means geometrically. The integral also means something geometrically, except instead of giving us the slope, it gives us the area under the curve. So if we wanted to take the integral to here from zero, we would integrate over this region the integral would be this whole area here, like that. And we would write that as the integral from 0 to a of our function. And in general, if we wanted to have an integral that didn't have these little limits, then that would be essentially the area under this curve from 0 to wherever this point x is. This isn't super great notation, but essentially what happens is the integral of a function is simply the area under this original function. So for instance, let's go over a couple of Really basic integrals. Let's say we wanted to take the integral of 2x. Um, we add this little dx portion on because um, basically, when we take the derivative of a function, say 4x, we take its derivative, its derivative is actually 4 times dx. So in order to integrate, we need a dx. That's just a little side note. Though. But looking at this integral, we need to think, OK, what's a function whose derivative is 2x? In other words, what's a function so that when we take the derivative of our function, we end up with 2x? We can think and say, well, if we have a function x squared, then its derivative would be by the power rule, just 2x. So x squared is an integral of 2x. But then we could also use x squared plus 1, because the derivative of x squared is still 2x, and then the derivative of 1 is just 0. So we could use x squared plus 5 as well, or x squared minus 23, like that, because all of these have the same derivative of 2x. 
So in general, we write that the integral of 2x dx is equal to x squared plus any constant, because this constant is not going to affect our derivative. And if we actually drew this out, we could see if we let c equal to 0, we would just have this parabola it's normal. And we would really just get a bunch of parabolas that are the exact same, just shifted. And they should all have the exact same slope at the same x value, which you can see, kind of see based on this not great picture. But at the same x value, they all have the same slope. And that's why we have a little constant up in. Um, has all of this made sense so far? All right, great. In that case, let's talk about some basic integration rules. So the integral of some constant k is equal to k times x plus, of course, our c. The integral of 0 is just equal to the constant c. The integral of k times some function f of x, if this k is a constant, we can actually just pull it out of our integral. You'll notice there isn't a plus c here because we haven't actually integrated yet. Um, we actually just started. So integrals are the first thing we've covered. Um, yeah. Let's see. We kept going on with a couple of our facts. We can get, if you have the integral of two functions that are added together, you can actually split that up into two separate integrals. Like this. And this is useful. Um, I do it a lot. Then we have essentially what's like the reverse power rule. It's the power rule for integers, for integrals, sorry. If you have the integral of x to some power of k, you can say that's 1 divided by k plus 1 times x to the k plus 1 plus c, provided that k is not equal to negative 1. And you can see if we actually took the derivative of this 1 over k plus 1 times x to the k plus 1, well, this 1 over k plus 1 is just a constant. So we leave that alone. Then by the power rule, we just multiply by the power on x, so times k plus 1, and then times x, and decrease the power by 1. And 1 over k plus 1 and k plus 1 cancel, and we're left with just x to the k. So we can see that this is the integral of x to the k. A last couple of facts. These are going to be just a couple of really basic integrals of trig functions. We had the integral of cosine of x is equal to sine of x plus c. And lastly, the integral of sine of x is negative cosine of x plus c. And these are just a few integration formulas you should know. Um, now, let's actually go ahead and do a few practice problems, because those are going, practice problems are what are going to get you better at integrals more than anything else. Um, I think one example first, actually. So let's say we have the integral of 3x squared plus cosine of x. 
Well, by one of our integration laws, we know that we can break this apart into two separate integrals. Because it's two separate functions. Next, we can integrate, actually we can pull this three out by, a sep by another rule. I'm not actually going to integrate our cosine x yet. Then we can go ahead and integrate this x squared using our reverse power rule. So that's going to be 1 over 3 times x cubed. Since remember, we multiply by 1 divided by the power plus 1, and then raise the power by 1. Then we would have plus a constant, plus the integral of cosine of x is sine of x plus c. Of course, this would probably be a different constant. And last, all we need to do is simplify. 3 and 1 third cancel. x cubed plus sine of x. Now, this c and this c1 aren't really specified, so I'm just going to add them together into a whole new constant like that. So then we only have one constant at the end. Does that make sense? Cool. And usually you won't actually see people write out these two separate constants like this. We'll just write plus c at the very end. All right, now here's some practice problems for you guys. luck.
All right, how does it come? See, one, you got negative one half x to the negative two. All right, that's good. Because we can rewrite it as the integral of x to the negative third. And then by the power rule, just increase the power by one. Don't forget the plus c on the end. That's something important to remember. But yes, the answer is negative one half x to the minus two plus c. You get one x plus three halves x squared plus c. Yep, that's correct. This one we can integrate just using a constant rule. It becomes a one times x, which I'm just going to write as x. Then we use the power rule again on this three x. We get three halves x squared plus c. All right, how about for c? said two thirds x to the sixth, yes, plus three x squared, good. Then plus seven divided by x plus c. Yep, looks right. Again, you just use the power rule on all of these. You do in fact get two thirds x to the sixth, plus three x squared, plus seven over x plus c. All right. Now, a slightly different style of problem. Find the integral of y prime times dx in the first one, y prime is equal to 2x plus 3 and y of 0 is equal to 4. And the second one, and if this is a bit confusing, um, if this is a bit confusing, really all I'm saying is, Part A, what is the integral of 2x plus 3 dx? And you know that one of the numbers should be a 4. Um, if you plug in 0 into this function, we should get 4. I think you can try that out for me.
this one you get x squared plus 3x plus 4. All right, good. Let's go over that really quick. We need to do the integral 2x plus 3x, and we get x squared plus 3x plus c. Then we need to plug in 0, so we get 0 plus 0 plus c, and that should be equal to 4. So c is equal to 4. So x squared plus 3x plus 4 is our answer. The second one you said negative 4 cosine of x minus 2. So we'll just double check that. We would need to start by doing the integral of 4 sine of x. We can pull that 4 out as a coefficient. And then the integral of sine x is negative cosine x. We have our plus c. Then we plug in pi. And we would get negative 4 cosine pi plus c. Cosine of pi is negative 1, so we get negative 4 times negative 1. So that's 4 plus c, and that should be equal to 2. So c is negative 2. So our integral is negative 4 cosine of x minus 2. Nice job. And maybe just one more. This one. Say y prime is 1 over x squared times x squared plus 4x cubed, and y4 is equal to 6. Go ahead and try that one out. All right, you say 2x squared plus x minus 30. Let's double check that. The first thing we should do is we should probably simplify this statement. So distributing the 1 over x squared in, we get, we're left with the integral of 1 plus 4x dx. And doing that integral, we get x plus 2x squared plus c. So then we simply plug in 4. 4 plus 2 times 4 squared plus c. That gives us 4 plus 16 times 2. So 4 plus 32, which is 36 plus c, and that should be equal to 6. So c is negative 30. So then our answer is plus x minus 30. Nice job. Okay, I think that's enough of the basic integrals. 
we can go ahead and talk about the some ways we approximate the area under a curve. To do that, I've got a little graphic to show you guys. Give me just a second. Okay. So we can approximate the area under a curve by using a bunch of little rectangles, which is kind of what's set up here. Here we have uh, was differentials and propagated error covered last week? Yeah, we touched over it last week. If you want, you went. You can always watch that lecture recording, um, or I could talk to you a bit with, about it after this review. But for now, I think we're just going to stick to what I've got planned out. So I'll, I can talk to you specifically about it though after this. Not a problem. Okay. So looking at this specific function, we have some function and we're approximating under it from two five by using a bunch of different rectangles, as you can see here. And of course, it's not it's not a perfect approximation. You can see we've actually got these little, almost triangular gaps between the rectangles and the actual function. Um, and in fact, depending on where we put the rectangles, we can either overestimate the area like we do here, or underestimate the area like we do here. And this is just one way we can approximate the area. Um, and let's see, as far as calculations go, it's helpful because if we use more and more rectangles, you can see these little error margins get smaller and smaller and smaller. Like so, like this is a pretty good approximation of the area. It's much better than this approximation, which is fairly poor. You've got these large gaps. That's not going to be a great approximation of area. But as far as calculating the area under these rectangles, let's see, we'll go back to our whiteboard. Um, it's not terribly difficult. So we'll go ahead and start off with an example. Let's say you want to approximate the area under this function f of x equals to 2x squared on the interval from 0 to 5 inclusive using 10 rectangles. So in order to do this, we're going to need to first figure out what kind of calculations we should be doing. So if we drew a really quick picture, we would have our function. It's going to look something like this, just a basic parabola. Um, let's say that this is 5. Then we would have a bunch of rectangles. all like this. Um, this is, of course, approximate. In fact, we're not even going to have solid 10 rectangles. We're probably going to end up with like seven. OK, that looks good enough. Um, basically, if we look at just one of these rectangles, let's say, this one right here. We can calculate its width. Well, we know that the area of one rectangle is length times width. Or in this case, instead of length, I'm going to say height. 
in this case, we know its width because we have an interval, 0 to 5, and a number of rectangles, 10. So if we break this inter interval from 0 to 5 evenly, well, that's a distance of 5 split into 10 parts. So it, its width is 1 half. Height is a bit trickier, but again, if you actually look at this picture we've drawn, we can see that its height actually stops at precisely where our function is right there, right? This is the height of our function, of our rectangle. It's just the function value, f of x, like that. So then the area of one rectangle is simply 1 half times f of x in this situation. But then if we wanted to calculate the total area, well, we're going to need to do some kind of summation, right? We, we have a bunch of different rectangles. We don't want to write all of them out. So we use the sigma notation. And we say, OK, we're going to start at some value, 1. And since we have 10 rectangles, that's going to be 10 different calculations we're performing. So we stop at this 10 value up top. Then we would have the area of one of our rectangles. Um, so 1 half times f of x. But in this case, we actually need to, we can't just say f of x, right? Because this summation is in terms of this variable i. So we need to figure out how i relates to x. And in this case, it's actually i minus 1 divided by 2. Um, it might actually, it's actually probably better to represent it by saying i divided by 2 minus 1 half. And the reason I did that is because our first value, if we're using because you'll notice that the top left corner of each rectangle is touching our function. So we're starting at this zero value. So our first rectangle should be f of zero, which means when we plug in i is equal to one, we should get f of zero. And we, we get that when we have one over two minus one over two. And then again, our second function should be exactly one step over, right rectangle over. Since our first rectangle is of width one half, we know that our second rectangle should start at x equals one half. Or in other words, each rectangle is one half further over than the last. That's why we have this i divided by two. So this is our function to approximate the area under f of x equals to 2x squared on this interval using 10 rectangles. If you plug that into a calculator, you would get 71.25. Does this kind of make sense? Um, why did I start i at 1? Um, because there are some functions that are helpful to use that start at i equals to 1. Um, and it's actually not bubbles now. Basically, there are a bunch of set formulas that people have figured out. And they all use i equals 1 to start with. So for instance, the sum from i equals 1 to n of some constant c is equal to c times n. Then the sum from i equals 1 to n of i 
is equal to n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Um, but you can see if we actually took this first one and instead of starting it at i equals 1, we started it at i equals to 0, we would have, it would run through the summation one more time. So it would actually have an extra c in it. That would actually end up being cn plus c because we're running through the summation one extra time. Yeah. Um, I suppose I'll finish off giving you these formulas because they are pretty important. Sum from i equals 1. n plus is n times n plus 1 times n plus times 2n plus 1. divided by 6, and we'll go with the last one, i equals 1 to n of i cubed is n squared times n plus 1 squared divided by 4. And these formulas, um, they're useful to help you figure out some of these more complicated sums. Um, for instance, this one here. Um, we don't want to actually calculate all of that by hand, but these formulas are useful because they take a sum, which is a lot of different calculations, and return just a single function. So, example, if we had, oh, please don't move that. There we go. For instance, if we had the sum from i equals 1 to 12 of just 7. Actually, 7 plus and so on. Instead, using our formula, we could just say it's 7 n. And since we know that n is equal to 12, well, that's just 7 times 12, which is easy. Like that. Um, why don't you guys try these ones out? Give me the exact values. And good luck. The denominator for i cubed, that would over 4.
All right, how's it coming? Is A three hundred? Okay. So we can actually say this whole estimation. You can actually see that four was a factor of everything. So we can actually pull it out since it's just a coefficient. It's not interfering with your actual sum. Now we have a general form. So we can actually rewrite this as the sum from as not as sorry not as a sum of n times n plus one divided by two. But then since we know that n is equal to twenty four, sorry, I forgot we've still got our four, and then twenty four twenty four plus one is twenty five divided by two. So there we get that is a 2 times 24 times 25, or 24 times 50, or 12 times 100. So I believe it should be 1,200. And I can the calculator. Um, And yes, the answer is 1,200. Um, maybe you forgot to multiply your answer by this 4 right here, because that is something we need. Um, again, since it is a coefficient, you can't just pull it out like that. Yep, that's fine. That's why you practice things. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to go over number part B and part C right now. So with this summation, we can actually rewrite it as the sum i equals 1 to 30 of if we uh, multiply this i minus 1 squared out, we would get i squared minus 2i plus 1. Then i squared is also a form. So we would get the So then we would get n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6 minus 2 times n times n plus 1 divided by 2 and then plus um, 1 times n like that. But then since n is equal to 30, this is 30 times 31 times 61 divided by 6 minus this 2 and the 1 half cancel. So we're left with 30 times 31 plus 30. And that should give us, oh dear, I should have put all these in a calculator before I got here, but well. That should give this like that. And then this last one, very similar to the second one, except we don't have this 2i, and of course, our n value is different. Regardless, we can say that this is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6 minus cn. Except in this case, our c is just 1. So minus n. And then we'd get 10 times 11 times 21 over 6 minus 10. And pardon, that would go to 5 and 3. 3 goes to 1, and 21 goes to 7. So that is 55 times 7 minus 10. And that 
gives us, I believe, 375. But that's kind of the basic process. You just need to essentially part your terms until you have your gener generic forms, i squared here. We've got uh, an i right here, and then this is just a coefficient, so we can multiply it out like that and just solve. They're not too bad once you get used to them. Sorry, does all this make sense? All right, cool. Let's see. All right, cool. Glad to hear it. Um, I think now we can probably go back and talk a little more just about how you set up these equations where you're, you're given an interval and you're asked to do that. I'm actually going to. No, I won't. OK. We want to do approximate um, x cubed on the interval one comma three using five rectangles. And we want this to be left hand sum, meaning our rectangles, if this is our function x cubed, meaning our rectangles touch our function in the top left corner. Like that. So the way we would set this up is well, there's basically a, a generic form for a left hand sum. That's going to be the sum i equals 1 to n. Let me check that really quick. These are, um, they're kind of like Riemann sums in that, well, let's see, a Riemann sum is what happens if you let the limit, uh, basically what happens when you take the area using an infinite number of rectangles. So it would be, the limit as n goes to infinity of the summation I equals 1 to n. In this case, our n is just equal to 5. So this isn't technically a Riemann sum, it's just an approximation. But we will talk about Riemann sums and kind of go over a brief introduction of them. Yeah. Yes. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, anyway, the general form for a left hand sum is the sum from i equals 1 up to specify this like the width of our rectangle. And then you would need to multiply by the height of our rectangle. And for that, that is going to be f of delta x times i minus, or sorry, plus some constant c value. Um, and this constant c value is basically just shifting our starting point in order to make sure that we're starting our interval at the right spot. In this case, we're having the sum from like 1 to 3. So if this is 1 and this is 3, well, if i starts at 1, then we want to make sure that our first rectangle has f of 1 in it. So that's kind of what this constant c value is. Um, in our case, we're defining our width of our rectangle, delta x, to be based off of the width of our interval, this whole distance, which is 3 minus 1, so 2, broken apart into five even pieces since we have five rectangles. Or in other words, 
the width divided by n. Um, one way to think about it is if your interval is from a to b, this is just b minus a over n, like that. So in our specific case, we would have the sum from i equals 1 to 5. Delta x is 2 divided by 5. Then we would have f of x. So f of delta x times i plus some c value. So our delta x is 2 fifths. If we let i equal to 1, then 2 over 5 times 1 is 2 fifths. So we need to add 3 fifths to make sure that our first rectangle should be f of 1. Make sense? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm basically saying I'm looking for just where my first rectangle should be. So if this is my very first rectangle right here, sorry, let me zoom in on that for you. Um, if this is our very first rectangle, well, we can, we already know its width. This is delta x. Over here, I'm so zoomed in, it's hard to write. Um, that is delta x. But then we need to know its height. And that can be this, this little red portion right there. That is our function value at some point. But then, Given our summation, this should be our very first rectangle. Or in other words, i should be equal to 1. Are you following so far? Cool. So since i is equal to 1, we have our general form. We know that in general, we want to have f of our delta x times i. So if we plug in i is equal to 1, we know what delta x is. 2 over 5 times 1, right? Then we need to add some kind of shift to make sure that this has the right starting value because our first rectangle should use this function value at this point exactly equal to one because that's where our does that make sense cool. so in that case Really, you're, you just need to, it's kind of like a mini equation. In fact, we don't necessarily even need all of these f's. We can just say 2 fifths times 1 plus c just needs to equal to our starting value. So then here it's really easy to see, oh, 2 fifths plus 3 fifths is equal to 1. So c is 3 fifths. Does that make sense? Um, in general, you don't necessarily have to think super hard about what the c value is, because for a left-hand sum, c is just going to be equal to a, which is going to be the starting value here, the left-hand side of your interval. In this case, it was 1 to 3, so a is equal to 1. So c is equal to a minus 1 delta x. Because you can see that for any i, 
or sorry, for any delta x, f of delta x times i plus c, so plus a minus delta x. Whenever i is equal to 1, that would be delta x plus a minus delta x, which is just equal to our starting value, which is exactly what we want our first rectangle's height to be. So for our left-hand sum, that c value is just a minus delta x. And for a right-hand sum, c is just equal to a because our first rectangle should occur instead. Um, let's see, I'm going to need to kind of Our rectangle should be touching at the top or on the right side of our equation, like this. Um, our rectangle is instead defined by the top right-hand corner. So if this is our starting number, if this is a, remember the width of our rectangles is delta x. So this point right here, let me actually draw that in red. This point right here is f of our starting point plus a delta x, which happens exactly when i is equal to 1 if we let c equal to a. So that's what it is for a right hand side. Um, now, if we wanted to finish the problem at hand, we have the sum of i equals 1 to 5 2 fifths then f of 2 fifths i plus 3 fifths, since f of x is equal to x cubed. Sorry, this was a while ago. Um, he spent a while talking about how to get c. Then we just plug in 2 fifths i plus 3 fifths, wherever we see x. And then it would be that cubed. And this is a sum we could actually calculate. And if we plugged that into the calculator, just one second to do so, get Yeah, we can we can do a right hand sum problem for this one as well. In fact, I'll give that one to you guys as practice. Three and we were using five rectangles. About fifteen point one two. And it's actually as you can see, we've got these little areas in green that actually aren't quite covered by our rectangles, but are still a part of the area. Underestimate. OK, um, go with a practice problem now. Let's see. There you go. Uh, calculate the right hand sum of f of x equals to two x plus three. Yeah, that's fine. On the interval from one to four, using six rectangles. And first try to set it up. And if you want to actually calculate the area, you can do that. But I think getting the setup is probably more important. So go ahead and try that one out. And good luck.
Let's see. No, I minus C. Right, it should just be A. Just got 31.5. All right, well, let's go ahead and check this. So, first off, we need to figure out, because we have six rectangles, n is equal to six, and a is equal to one, and b is equal to four. So you can say delta x is b minus a over n, or minus one over six, which is equal to over six, so one half. Of course, we're going to add the sum from i equals 1 to n, which is 6, of delta x, so 1 half times f of, in this case, it's just delta x times i, or i over 2, minus, sorry, plus, oh, you forgot f of x. Yeah, that'll, that'll do it. Um, but what did you get for your c value in this case? Yeah, that's fine, though. See. Yeah. But what did you get for your C value? Calculate that. Uh, you said point five. In this case, it would just be equal to a to one. Yeah. Um, if we drew out a picture, uh, our f of x would be something kind of like this. Um, because we're starting at this one value, our rectangles, sorry, this is actually a, it's not the right rectangle. A rectangle is, if this is 1, remember, a rectangle is defined by the right side of the rectangle. So that's going to be this portion right here. So our first rectangle would need to be at f of a plus 1 delta x. But since we start out with i equal to 1, that provides our first delta x. So we can just have delta x times i plus a. So c is a. So this would be our summation. If we rewrite our f of x in terms of what this function actually is, we get the sum from i equals 1 to 6 of 1 half times 
2 i over 2 plus 1 plus 3, which becomes the sum from i equals 1, 6 of boy. This is 1 half times 2 times i over 2 is just i, then plus 2 plus 3. So that's i plus 5. And I'm just going to go ahead and plug that into a calculator because I don't want to do it entirely by hand. And this. And we get 25.5. That would be our answer in this case. Now we are just about out of time. We'll talk about Riemann sums in more detail next week.